I love to talk about tractor supply, so it's what we're going to talk about this, this afternoon. Talk about the history of the company, the factors that led to its great success, and uh, then I'm going to share with you some of my tips about, about leadership and, and uh, what it takes to run a, run a great company. But first, I want to do a little quiz. And I want to ask you, how many of you shop at Tractor Supply? All right. Uh, thank you very, very much for your business. <clears throat> Second part of the quiz, how many of you own a horse? I love you. I love you. You all know what a horse is, don't you? A horse is a giant expensive pet. And Tractor Supply is the pet store for horses. Now, those of you that don't have a horse, my friend Charlie will be out there in the lobby and he'll help you arrange, arrange for a purchase later on. You know, we look at, uh, I bring that horse thing up because we, we try to do things thinking about business and our operations in the long term. And, and when we look at customers, we look at the lifetime value of the customer. And so if you own a horse, we know that if you shop at Tractor Supply, you're going to spend somewhere between eight and $10,000 on that horse. And then for those of you that have multiple horses, we love you even more. <laughs> at Tractor Supply, we try to make long-term decisions. When we look at a customer, we say, this is not a customer for today, this is a customer for a lifetime. And we look at the long-term value of that customer, as we do, you know, like, the more horses you have, the more we love you. The more you spend with us, the more we love you. And we look at things in the long term. When we make decisions about, are we gonna add more stores or are we gonna invest in our people, it's always about investing in our people because in the long term, that's what pays the greatest benefits. I want to go back and share a little history with you, uh, talk about how Tractor Supply got started. It was founded in 1938 in Chicago by a man named Charles Schmidt, and his business plan was to become the Walmart of tractor parts. Now, in those days, there were six million farms in America. Tractors were pretty simple pieces of equipment. They broke down all the time and the parts business was a great business. He built stores, began to sell parts across the country. He was selling them less expensively than the, than the dealerships and, and therefore built a very nice business. The company grew, was listed on the New York Stock Exchange in the 1950s, and, uh, and over time, uh, the, the company continued to do very, was very successful. However, there were two dark clouds on the horizon. One was that Tra tractors were, be getting, were getting larger, more complex, and they didn't break down nearly as often. So this whole business of parts was, was a business that didn't have a whole lot of growth potential. And then the second part is that the number of farms, remember I said there were six million farms in 1939? By 1969, there were three million farms. So Mr. Schmidt, in 1969, <clears throat> allowed his company to be absorbed by another great big company, and it became just another subsidiary of, of a large company. And over the next 12 years, as a subsidiary of a large company, Tractor Supply went through a lot of difficulties. Uh, we were uh, each, they had five presidents over a dozen years, and as you might imagine, trying to find a niche in the market uh, to replace the, the, the declining tractor parts business, and one president would go in this direction, and another president would go in that direction, and, and none of those original four were successful. However, the fourth president is a fellow who had at one time lived in Roanoke, Virginia, and our company was located in Chicago in a four-story walk-up in a pretty poor neighborhood, and he decided he wanted to move the company and got permission from the parent to move the company, and because he had lived in Roanoke and Nashville was like Roanoke and we had a regional office here, he moved the company to Nashville in 1979. <clears throat> now, we're, we love Nashville and we love being here, and I can tell you, Absolutely, if we had not moved away from inner city Chicago, we would not be where we are today. And we simply love Tennessee. It's been a wonderful, wonderful home since 1979. Uh, the, however, he made a good decision moving to Tennessee, but he didn't make other good decisions, so he was gone after a while too. And, and the fifth of, those 12, fifth of those five presidents over that 12 year period came. His name was Tom Hennessy, big old Irishman, good man, solid business guy, and he made several very, very good decisions on the front end, and the company began to rebound, and we began to move in the right direction. Uh, a year and a half later, uh, we were put up for sale along with a half a dozen other subsidiaries, and by the end of that year, Tom and I 
and three other fellows were fortunate enough to buy the company uh, on a shoestring in a traditional leverage buyout and ran the company for 10 years as a private company and, and then as the commissioner said earlier, we went public in 1994 and, and we've had a tremendous track record. Now statistically, when I, in 1981 when Tom Hennessy took over, there were 100 stores. Today, there are 1,200 and some odd stores. In 1981, we did 100 million in sales, 100 million in revenues. This year, the company will do $5 billion. <laughs> Been a heck of a track record. Now, o over the past 30 years, there have been four CEOs of the company. Tom Hennessy, Joe Scarlett, Jim Wright, and now Greg Sanford. And if you worked for the company, you'd know the names have changed on a corner office door, but you would also know that the basic value structure in the company has not changed once over that 30 years. So we have tremendous consistency, which is a big part of the success of the company. Uh, I'd also like to point out a small thing, but something I'm very proud of. Uh, the company is now 75 years old, and next Thursday uh, in New York, the three living CEOs, of which I'm one obviously, are going to open the NASDAQ to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the company. So, <clears throat> so now you're probably thinking, well, why is the company successful? There are two, there are a lot of success factors, but there are two key success factors in the in why the company has been successful and been able to outrun the competition. Uh, the first has to do with identifying a new and different and unique customer, and the second has to do with building a culture, a winning culture. Well, let's take the first one. When, in the early 1980s, when Tom and I and the others were beginning to run the company, we spent lots of time in the stores. And in the stores, there were lots of different people there. There were people in suits, and there were people in blue jeans, and there were people who and coveralls who were obviously farmers, but, but it was a, a mix of people and you couldn't put your finger on who they were. They were doctors and lawyers and school teachers and factory workers and who knows what all, they were from everywhere. And, and so that we put that into the mix of how we were thinking about the business because these are not farmers. There are a few farmers, but, but not a lot. And, and then we went to study our numbers and we were very fortunate in that the company was data rich. So we would study our, our, what we're selling. We knew what we were selling, every item, every store, company-wide, we can slice it and dice it in any way we liked. And what we found, as you might imagine, is everything to do with production agriculture, the sales were at best flat and probably declining. But sales that had to do with other things that were not related to production agriculture continued to, be, to, continue to grow. Example, anything to do with dogs and cats. Dog food, cat food, kennels, collars, leashes, treats, whatever, you, it was all on a big incline. And as you might imagine, anything to do with horses was on a big incline, too. I will get you to buy some horses before we're finished. <laughs> we were selling uh, truck toolboxers and welders and air compressors and riding lawnmowers turned into our number one category, and we sold work clothing. And, and finally, we just came to the conclusion that, that this is really not farming that we're in. This is something else. And the something else we called a hobby farmer. And, and, we, and we made this strategic shift away from production agriculture to marketing to hobby farmers. And that changed the dynamics of the business in the early 1980s. It changed, obviously, what we carry. We moved toward carrying more of the product that related to the target customer. Uh, it, it, it changed how we advertised, what we advertised, and who we advertised to. Um, it changed store locations. No longer did we want to put a store in a Midwestern, in the middle of Iowa, we want to put stores in, in the towns surrounding big cities where there are these hobby farmers. Uh, for example, within 50 miles of here, there are a dozen tractor supply stores today. It changed the hours we were open. Instead of closing at 5, we stayed open until 7 or 8. Many of our stores used to close on Sunday. They're all open on Sunday. It changed who we hired. Um, we used to try to hire a lot of farmers. Now we're trying to hire people who are our target customers, and today, and one of the success factors is that about 80% of the people that work in our stores are in fact what we would define as hobby farmers. They come from the livestock. So that changed the, changed the dynamics of the business dramatically and our competitors paid a little attention but not a lot of attention. We simply focused our efforts 100% on hobby farmers. 30 years ago, there were about 40 chains of farm and ranch stores like ours across the country. We were a large one, but we were not the largest. Today, Tractor Supply has three times more stores than the next five competitors put together. 
It's been a tremendous track record. So that's success factor number one, really identifying a special customer and going after that customer with 100% of your efforts. The second success factor is building a culture, building a culture based on always doing the right things, always doing the right things with our employees, always doing the right things with our customers, always tr building tremendous working relationships with our business partners, primarily merchandise suppliers, and being good in the community. And we built, we built a mission and a value structure in a company that we're very proud of. And a lot of companies will have you know, a mission or a value structure and they'll put it in the handbook and that'll be the end of it. A tractor supply, it's everywhere. It's on the handbooks, it's on the walls, it's in the company publications, it's in every single sales meeting we have. It's talked about all the time. As a matter of fact, we carry a little copy of our mission and values with us. And, and when we talk to people, we're happy to share it with people. Our mission is to work hard, have fun, and make money by providing legendary service and great products at everyday low prices. That's, that's what we really believe in. And it's not just all over the place, it's in our hearts. And we talk about it and talk about it regularly. As part of that process, we are committed to an ethical work environment. We, we simply have no toleration for a lack of principles, a lack of ethics anywhere in the company. And as a result, because we talk about it regularly and because that's part of what we honestly and truly believe in, we have very few ethical lapses in the company. We believe in education. Earlier I said if we had a choice of investing in stores or investing in people, we'd invest in people. We built Tractor Supply University. I think it's the best educational institution in retailing. I'd put it up against anyone. Uh, and I'll just give you a little snippet. Before you can become a store manager, you have to learn a lot of things in the stores, a lot of technical things, obviously. But before you can actually take over running a store, you have to come into Nashville and you have to spend a week in a class. And that class is not about technical things, it's about people things. It's about how to select good people, how to build teamwork, how to do evaluations, understanding about the company culture and the value structure and where we're going and what the future looks like and, and how to resolve issues and how to, you know, all about the value structure and the classes are taught primarily by senior executives. In those one-week classes, I would devote either 10 or 12 hours, something like that, to the classes. I would teach several classes. I'd go out to dinner with the group one night. Uh, they, would, they, would, they would get to know the company. So by the time they became a store manager, whether it's around the corner or a thousand miles away, they didn't have to look over their shoulder to make a decision. They knew, they had met all the senior management, they knew what we believed in, and they had confidence in, in, in running their business. And then we empowered people in the stores. <clears throat> we don't want to make decisions, we want the people in the stores to make decisions. Another little, little thing that I'm very proud of, uh, in the stores, as you might imagine, every retailer, everybody says satisfaction guaranteed, which we certainly do too, but there's a sign hanging in the stores that says satisfaction guaranteed. Underneath that, in smaller font, are the words that say, every team member has the authority to do whatever it takes. So if you work for us, you look up there and you say, wow, the company trusts me. And we do. We trust people in the stores. Take care of the customers no matter what. Our goal is never to get a customer complaint centrally. We want it resolved in the store, and we empower people in the stores to take care of it. So we really, we're committed to doing the right things throughout the organization. And as leaders, uh, we, try to, uh, we try to model the right behavior. Model the right behavior by not spending time in our offices, but spending time with the people doing the work. By getting out and mingling, by listening, by talking, by paying attention. In my 30 years, half of my work weeks went something like this. Monday afternoon, I would leave town, I'd take with me an operating person, another staff person, maybe from HR or the buying office or accounting or real estate or anywhere, and we'd go meet a district manager somewhere and we would visit those stores for three days. And we'd talk to every person in the store, we'd look, listen to what's going on, we'd find out what the customers are asking for, what problems there are, why was the truck late, why are we out of stock in this, why are we, you know, and we just keep listening and listening and listening. And by modeling that behavior, by me modeling it, everybody mod follows the boss, we had lots and lots, of, we're in the stores all the time, listening to what's going on, and therefore making the decisions that really make a difference. We model the right behavior. This is one I really like to talk about. You know, every, every company says they want to be frugal. We want to be frugal too. We model the right behavior. We traveled on Southwest 
I saw a Southwest representative walking around here somewhere. Traveled on Southwest, we stayed in the Hampton Inn, we had lunch at Subway, and we had dinner at Olive Garden. That's being frugal. So we were modeling the right behavior. One other thing about, about leadership uh, in, this, in our company, and I think this pertains to all of us, we, we've, all of us in leaders, leadership, we, you know, we got 10 ideas in our head, we want to communicate all 10 ideas. And we learned over time that you really don't want to communicate all 10, you want to focus on the one, two, or three things that are really important and over-communicate those. And that's what we learned to do and that's what we did. Anyway, we built a great culture. So if you look at Tractor Supply's 30-year success, identifying a unique and different customer and running to that customer when the competitors were sort of just talking about it. And the second is building a culture that really supported, uh, to supported that strategy and supports the, a great kind of work environment. Those are the things that, that create Tractor Supply's success. Um, I've been in leadership roles, uh, as the commissioner mentioned, for, for about 50 years. I've studied leadership. I've been a leader, <coughs> taught leadership, and, and uh, I want to share with you a few thoughts about leadership. Um, I'll share with you four, four things that I think are very important. One, never ever compromise your principles. I am absolutely convinced the bad guys all get caught no matter where you are. So just don't ever compromise your principles. And when you're in a leadership role, talk about that to other people, particularly young people. Young people may not quite understand what the rules are and so on. And we, as leaders, have an obligation to really set, set the rules and set them straight. And, and when, you, when you don't compromise your principles and you do the right things, other people will follow that lead. And the, and the bad guys, believe me, the bad guys all get caught sooner or later. Second, surround yourself with great people. The most important decision that leaders make is the selection of the people they surround themselves with. If you surround yourself with winners, you've got a great chance of being a winner. And, and if you're in a leadership role, you ought to always be on a recruiting bench. You always got to be thinking about, how am I going to build my team? Just continually, continually think about, about what's next and how am I going to build the very best possible team? Because when, as I like to say, if you surround yourself with stars, you can be a star. And if you surround yourself with turkeys, you're going to get sliced up for Thanksgiving. Third, set clear direction. You know, sometimes we think that, well, I told him what to do, he knows what to do. You don't. You've got to I mean, set clear direction for your team. Keep talking about it. Be persistent. Be focused. Be clear. Be unmistakable. Your people should know not what we're going to do necessarily next week, but next month and six months and a year down the road. We as leaders have an obligation to set the path for people. And when people understand the path, sometimes they'll run down it faster than you think. I'll tell you a story about vision. 1990, I wasn't the CEO yet, but I knew I was going to be pretty soon, and I delivered a talk about the vision for the future of the company, and my boss had really never quite done that, and I, put, I brought together all the different parts of our organization where I knew we were going, and I delivered this talk, and there was, not, there was only one original thing in the whole talk I did. I talked about where we're going in operations and technology and logistics and merchandising and marketing and so on. And, and the only original thing I added at the end of this thing was that we're going to double the size of the company over the next five years with a combination of new stores and same store sales gains. Well, what happened over the next couple of years is that because I talked about this and told everybody what everybody was doing and talked about it repetitively, you, you, the, the silos came down. People began to work together. People began to get things done together. There was part, there were collaboration where there had not been collaboration before. And things really, really came together, and, and, and they are today, too. And when I look back on, on my challenge to double the size of the company, we were doing $200 million then. Our, our goal was to double the size of the company, 400, $400 million. Five years later, we actually went up to $450 million. So as, as leaders, setting clear direction, letting people know what your vision is for the future of your organization can make all the difference in the world in how your team performs. My fourth thought is build a teamwork environment. I talked about listening in the stores. Listening, listening to the people who work for you is very important. They've all got things to say, and they've got plenty of knowledge. And in total IQ, they've got more than you've got. So the more you listen to those people, the more you can learn. Uh, uh, we believe in keeping no secrets. When you keep no secrets, everybody's on board. Everybody can work together. Building teamwork, recognizing performance. The number one motivator of people is recognition. When, when Charlie walks out the door today, pat him on the back. Good job today, Charlie. It took you five seconds to say that. It made all the difference in the world to him. And when you have a big success, celebrate it. 
Celebrate the successes. And the more you celebrate and recognize, the more people are going to work for you. So my four thoughts on leadership. Never compromise your principles. Surround yourself with great people. It's all about the people you surround yourself with. Uh, I never worked particularly hard because I surrounded myself with great people. Set clear direction and be repetitive about it. Build a teamwork environment. Do everything you can to get your team working together. Now, two thoughts on a personal basis. And I ask people this all the time in our classes and in our, back in our company when I was working too. What is your learning agenda? Everybody. Every, I was going to say everybody in a leadership role. Everybody in the world needs to have a learning agenda. You can't be standing still. The world is changing all the time. So what is your learning agenda? And if you don't have one, I suggest you give it some thought. What are you doing? I have a learning agenda. I've had a learning agenda for, I'd like to say, all my life. It's not been that long, but it's been the last 35 years or so. Always learning, always trying to network with people, to, to read a magazine, to read a book, to take a class, to get to know people, to do, to do something to, to learn all the time because that's how you get better. I, I like to tell people, you know, if, if you sit, be, sit in your cubicle every day and brown bag it to work, you're missing an opportunity because every day you got to eat lunch somewhere. If you eat lunch looking at yourself, that's not nearly as good as eating lunch talking to somebody who can help you, a competitor, a peer, a friend, whatever. Get to know other people. Don't waste your time brown bagging it, eating, looking in a mirror at yourself. So develop a learning agenda. It'll make all the difference in the world to your success, and, and it'll make you a more interesting person. The more you know, the more interesting you are. Besides, when you go home at night, you'll have something to talk to your spouse about. Last thought, take time to think. We all are running through life probably faster now than ever before. We're answering emails and doing this, that, and the other thing, and we don't take time to think, and I'm as guilty as most of, most of you probably are. But here's my solution, and I'll challenge you, challenge you all on this. A Couple of times a year, Take a notepad, go somewhere all by yourself. Nobody, no, no phones, no radio, nothing. Just go somewhere by yourself. Take a notepad and a pencil. And you can take your dog with you because he won't say anything. <clears throat> and, and just close your eyes and I want you to ask yourself three questions. Number one, my business unit, six months from now, a year from now, 18 months from now, what's gonna happen? What's coming down the road? What's my boss gonna expect? What happens if uh, Mary gets promoted? What happens if Charlie takes a job in someplace else? Uh, what do I have to anticipate in terms of growth? Just think about it. Not next week, but think about it way down the road. And you know what? You just might jot down some ideas that you hadn't thought about previously. And then second, think about your career. How am I doing career-wise? Am I going where I want to go? Am I happy where I am? Do I want to go someplace else? If I want to go someplace else, do I have a plan? Have I talked to my boss? Have I talked to the HR department? Have I read what I need to read? Do I know what I need to do? A lot of times we just sort of stumble along in life hoping, well, well, something will happen. I might get promoted next month. Put yourself in a position to get promoted by learning what you need to learn, by associating with those that you need to associate with, by going to whatever conferences you need to go to. And third, keep your eyes closed. Think about your personal relationships. How am I doing with my spouse and my children and my parents? Maybe my aunts and uncles too, and, and just uh, and I challenge you all who are married, just write down one thing that I can do to make my relationship with my spouse a little bit better this year. So I would challenge you all to just somewhere along the line, take time to think all by yourself. And I, I will bet that most of you will make some change in what you're doing and changes that will be, that will be for the better. So anyway, those are my thoughts about the history of Tractor Supply, Tractor Supply success, some thoughts about leadership, and uh, I, I will leave you with the thought that my friend Charlie's in the lobby and he's still anxious to help you all buy a horse. So I thank you all very much. <laughs>